Live from Chicago, it's Elvis night. That's right. It's Elvis night. Thank you. Thank you very much. As the White Sox take on the Seattle Mariners right here on Comcast Sportsnet. Alongside former Cy Young Award winner Steve Stone, sorry to see that impersonation, probably not up to par, but this Chuck Swirsky filling in for the Hawk, who's a little bit under the weather. And Steve, the bullpen last night, not under the weather because they got the job done, huge safe situation as well. Zach Duke came in and Zach Duke pitched out of a second and third, nobody out situation. And he did it with a couple of strikeouts. And then one soft fly ball, and it was out of the seventh inning, still with the lead intact at four to two. Then Nate Jones came in, and he threw the ball exceptionally well, as he's been doing recently. And then David Robertson nailed it down, his 27th save of the year. So, indeed, the bullpen was exactly where it should have been last night, which is saving the game, which is something that Robin loves to see. Absolutely, and I love what the White Sox are doing offensively. Second half of the season, Steve, when those table setters get on base, good things happen. Last night, Adam Eaton did a whale of a job as he scored three runs. Got three hits, and he got hit. So this is starting off the ball game, and as you can see, a season-high three runs scored. And Adam Eaton stole a base, did just a terrific job. And when he's getting on, lets the big guys in the middle drive him home, and that's exactly what they did last night. Usually when that happens, the Sox win a ball game. Last night, no exception. All right, so let's talk a little pitching now, Steve, because veteran Johnny Dank's on the bound for the White Sox tonight. Taiwan Walker, very intriguing young pitcher for Seattle. Both of these guys went head-to-head -head in Seattle, and neither fared very well. As you can see, against one another on August 23rd, Taiwan Walker went five and two-thirds, gave up five runs on seven hits. Johnny Danks went five, gave up seven runs on eight hits. So both of them looking for a turnaround here tonight. Hopefully, Johnny Danks will be able to do it. He throws very well here at home. He's had some problems on the road, but this is U.S. Cellular Field. Yes, it is. Looking forward to working with you, Stephen. Thank you. So don't be cruel. Maybe one of the songs tonight, but Jose Abreu, three for five, including a homer off Walker in Seattle last weekend. And Robin, of course, hopes for that and more tonight as the White Sox take on the Mariners in game two of the four-game series next on Comcast Sportsnet.
Sox Baseball on Comcast Sportsnet is brought to you in part by your Chicago area and Northwest Indiana Lexus dealer who invites you to test drive a Lexus today. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois, through it all. Audi, truth in engineering. Xfinity, your home for the most live sports. And by Toyota. The annual clearance event is going on now. Toyota, let's go places. Welcome back to beautiful U.S. Cellular Field. And there's a couple of guys getting in the spirit of Elvis Knight. Jose Quintana. I'm Sale Garcia. Very happy to celebrate it. Always a big night here at the ballpark. So let's take a look at how Lloyd McClendon is going to line up his Mariners tonight. Cattell Marte leads it off, and it's Kyle Seeger, Nelson Cruz in right field with Robinson Cano, Franklin Gutierrez, Austin Jackson, Mark Trumbo, the DH. He's reached safely in 16 of 17 games against our Sox with Logan Morrison and Jesus Sucre rounding it out. The defense and out the lineup behind Johnny Danks, it's Cabrera, Eaton, and Garcia in the outfield. Saladino, Ramirez, Sanchez, and Abreu in the infield. Giovanni Soto behind the plate. And our Lexus pursuing perfection starting pitcher is Johnny Danks. On for his 25th start, looking for his seventh win. There you look at the numbers. Left-handers haven't done much with him. The umpires for the game tonight. Mike Everett behind the plate. Tim Timmons at first. Tim Welke, the crew chief at second. Chris Siegel is at third. So they've thrown the ball around the infield, and that means that we're ready to play baseball. I'm ready to turn it over to my play-by-play -play partner tonight, Chuck Swirsky. All right, Stephen, thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Always a pleasure. The Hawk under the weather. And, Steve, you thought you could get rid of me when I filled in for Hawk in late May, early June. I did 12 ball games with you, and it was a pleasure. But, no, I'm back for another You're ball back. game. And it feels good to be in the booth, and we wish Hawk all the best. He'll return tomorrow, and we are underway here with Johnny Danks on the mound, as Steve mentioned, 3-0 with a 195 ERA over the last six starts here in Chicago. Robin Ventura, very high on what he's seen out of Danks in the second half of the season. A backhanded by Ramirez, and it gets past Abreu. And the Seattle leadoff man, Cattell Marte, is on at first. So the question now for Bob Rosenberg is, what do you call that? And with and Rosie, you never know. E6. <laughs> so Marte reaches on an error of our Ramirez. For Marte, only his 25th big league ball game. There's been a lot of floating pieces for Seattle in the infield this year. That's going to bring on Kyle Seeger, former All Star, former Gold Glove Award winner. Manning third base tonight. Seeger came on to pinch hit last night, made the last out of the ball game on a ground ball of short. 18 homers, 49 out revives, batting 254. In December, Steve, he signed a mammoth contract with the Mariners, seven years, $100 million. At that point, I don't think they expected 254. No. That's ripped to right field. So the Mariners now doing some damage early in this ball game with the first two men on base. Lefties haven't done much against Johnny Danks, but he throws a fastball down the middle. It's 92 and down in the zone, and Seeger hits the daylights out of it. He had a tough series against us in Seattle. Starting off this one pretty well. That's going to bring on Nelson Cruz. Cruz aiming to become the first American League player to lead the league in homers and hits since Jim Rice with the Red Sox in 78. Only a handful of players in big league history have accomplished that, including the likes of Ty Cobb, along with Lou Gehrig, and talking with Steve prior to the ball game. You had trouble with Cobb with a breaking ball. I had much more trouble with Gehrig. I didn't think he was durable enough. <laughs> Popped him up. Infield fly rule was yep. called. 
And that was a first pitch straight change. Retiring a very tough hitter. That's going to bring on Robinson Cano. Cano in his second season with the Mariners after signing a huge contract. 10 years, 240 million, has eight years left at 24 million a year. Four time All Star last year, 14 homers, 82 RBIs, batting 314 a season ago. His average has dipped, Steve, to 278 this season. He's still a good player. It's just tough to build a ball club around a guy that, as a Yankee, he was a player. He was one of the players, just not the guy. Good point. There's a chopper. Abreu goes to second. Over to first. That's a twin kill. Great job for the White Sox after Seattle gets the first two men on base. We go to the bottom of the first here in Chicago. White Sox coming to bat with Eaton, Abreu, and Cabrera on Comcast Sportsnet. Who's been pretty good against Seattle this year? Then Abreu and Cabrera at the top with Garcia, LaRoche, and Ramirez in the middle, followed by Soto, Sanchez, and Saladino. The defense and now the lineup behind Taiwan Walker, Gutierrez, Jackson, and Cruz in the outfield with Seeger, Marte, Cano, and Morrison in the infield. Asu Sucre behind the plate, and our Lexus pursuing perfection starting pitcher is Taiwan Walker. Hard throwing right hand around for his 26th start. He's 9 and 7, his ERA, a little higher than he would like. 139 strikeouts and 146 and two thirds. That's a career high, Steve, for innings pitched by Taiwan Walker, 146 plus. As you mentioned, fabulous athlete, 6'4, 235 pounds. As Adam Eaton steps in. Walker was a spectacular high school basketball star at Ukaipa High School in California. In fact, one of his high school teammates was Matt Davidson, who's in the White Sox system, patrolling third base in Charlotte, the AAA affiliate of the White Sox. Davidson with 20 homers on the season. Talking with Lloyd McClendon prior to the ballgame, the manager of Seattle, very, very high, likes the way he's matured this season. Talking about uh, Walker, McClendon said that he's letting the game come to him. He's got a big fastball, has a curveball to go with it with a straight change, and usually very good control. But he didn't fare very well out in Seattle as these two guys went head to head. Johnny Danks had problems with them, and Walker had problems with our ball club. Little roller to first, gloved by Morrison, and Eaton is retired. <laughs> That's going to bring on Jose Abreu. And Abreu had success in the Pacific Northwest against Taiwan Walker. If Walker falls behind that fastball, doesn't have a great deal of life on it. 
And even though he can get it up there 96 97 it's still fairly straight. But he does have a cutter. And that's probably what he'll break out against the right handers that cutter around 90 miles an hour. You know, Steve, often you talk about cutters and whatnot. What is a cutter? When someone says he throws a cutter, what does that mean? From a right hand pitcher, it moves away from a right hand hitter. And it stays on the same plane. It doesn't go down like a slider would. And so when the hitter goes to measure it on the sweet spot of the bat, it just moves off that sweet spot and he usually catches it off the end of the bat. The right hand pitcher throws it to a left hand hitter. He's going to cut it inside on him. It moves from the good part of the bat in on his hands. As Abreu strikes out, this is a Seattle ball club that has really underachieved. And let's go to our picks to click tonight. The crew took Saladino. Steve went with Adam Eaton. I, I actually want to go with Dick Allen, but the truck would not allow me to do so. So Melky, I took Melky, you know, 12 times when I was doing the games with you, Steve. Yeah, on that, that long road that trip. That point, Melky wasn't hitting. No, he was not. I want not. you to take Zeke Panura. <laughs> But Cabrera, you know, you you look at the turnaround he has had, and he has been on fire the second half of the season, Steve, because we saw him on that road trip with Toronto, Baltimore, Houston, and the Texas Rangers. What, what's been the key here? He started first hitting the ball very hard, but hitting it at people, and then they started to fall. He's been very good left-handed. Right-handed has given some problems. But all year long, Melky from the left side, well, he's hitting 290 this year, right side 223. Well, this whole White Sox ball club, the second half of the season, their run production, Steve, has gone up a run per game from the first half. Since 2010, the White Sox are 19 and 4 here against Seattle. They were talking about it. I talked to the Seattle broadcasters and they were talking about just that fact that they've been dominated at U.S. Cellular Field for whatever reason. And again, there's no rhyme, no reason to it. But Seattle's had some good teams, some bad teams, whatever the quality of the team, they just haven't been able to win here. One and two, the count to Melky Cabrera here in the bottom of the first. This is Seattle Ball Club going through a transition period today. They made a decision to release their general manager who had been with the ball club for the last several seasons, Jack Zorincic. It's a base hit to right center field. Cabrera turns first, and he's going for two with a stand up double. This is one of those Walker curveballs, and we told you about the speed of them. They're in the low 70s, and when you play them as an opposite field hitter, but throw them slow breaking balls, they're going to pull it into the gap, cost them a two base hit. So I'll be at 267, 11 homers, and 49 RBIs. Seattle 10 games under 500. They're trailing Houston, Steve, by 12 games in the American League West. They won 87 games a season ago, seventh best in franchise history. What they didn't expect was they had a bullpen last year. Seven guys, best bullpen in the league, best bullpen in the major leagues. They expected at least most of them to come back and be really good again. Four of those guys are in the minor leagues right now. Really? Yeah, and the bullpen just fell apart. Sharply hit as the shortstop Marte throws over the first and the inning is retired. We go to inning number two here in Chicago Mariners and White Sox on Comcast Sportsnet.
especially watch it on Liberty Communications in beautiful downtown West Liberty, Iowa. Just a reminder, as you enjoy a cold one, to look forward to Miller time later in the game, brought to you by <clears throat> Miller Light. Chuck Swirsky along with uh, Steve Stone, the Hawk under the weather, and he'll be back tomorrow. We wish him all the best. I know he's watching. Hawk, we miss you here. A lot of Elvis impersonators. We're asking for you. There's a few of those in the ballpark. Yes, there are. <laughs> Here we are, the top of the second. Franklin Gutierrez, the left fielder, stepping in. Did you know Elvis was a baseball fan of the St. Louis Cardinals? When he was living at his mansion in Graceland in uh, the Memphis area, he would listen to games, KMOX in St. Louis, with that booming 50,000 watt signal, and he would listen to Cardinals baseball. He was a huge fan of Harry Carey. Yes, he was. He was. And in fact, he surprised Harry. They had a meeting at the Chase Hotel in St. Louis. Did Harry recognize him? <laughs> That's the key. That it is the on, key. Depends on what time they met. <laughs> you got me there, Steve. You're right. This Seattle team, this is just the start of a long road trip, folks. Second game of 10 straight on the road. They've got stops coming up with uh, the Angels and with Oakland. But it is amazing, Steve, as you mentioned last year, the bullpen great. This year, obviously. A major, major disappointment, Danks. You know, Steve, how do you judge when you're evaluating a bullpen from year to year? It's so fickle, is it not? I think it's pretty difficult. It's pretty difficult to count on the guys that you have to count on, knowing that they'll come back and be the same guys that pitched really well for you last year. It's a base hit to right center field. That's going to bring on Austin Jackson. That's one of the most difficult things for any general manager, and it's certainly one of the things, not the thing, but one of the things that cost Jack Zarensic his job was a bullpen that he counted on to be even close to what it was last year. And absolutely nothing went right for that bullpen this year. So the Mariners with the leadoff man on here in the top of the second. Jackson with a six game hitting streak. And he has hit safely in 13 of the past 15 games. Steve, he has been involved in not one but two major trades in his career. Well, for Curtis Granderson, certainly that was a major trade because he went to the Yankees to take advantage of that park, and Jackson went to Detroit. And that's ripped to left center. Just missed the diving Ramirez. And again, Seattle, as they did in any number one here in the second frame, they have the first two batters on base. Johnny gets that change up up. When he does that, things don't go very well for him. And high change ups turn into line drives. That's exactly what happened with Jackson. So first and second for the Mariners and Trumbo, the designated hitter at the plate against Danks. How would you evaluate, Steve, what you've seen out of Danks the last month or so? I think he's been a whole lot better than he was earlier in the year. I think we've seen some games where the fastball has been very lively for him. But as always the case with him, if he gets a change up up, he has problems. If he keeps it down, he'll throw some double play ground balls. He certainly will throw a double play ground ball if he keeps it down to Trumbo. Problem is Trumbo is a home run hitter with an uppercut swing. He has, however, between the Arizona Diamondbacks and Seattle Mariners, 
grounded into 12 double plays this year. Dinks behind on the count. Two and one to Trumbo, who was acquired by the Mariners from Arizona, part of a six player deal on June the 3rd. Nobody out here for the Mariners. Steve mentioned a healthy swing by Trumbo. And he whipped him. That's going to bring on Logan Morrison. Morrison back in 2011. You know, he had that one good year, Steve, with the Marlins. I watched Morrison play in the Arizona Fall League and I thought there was no way he couldn't be a star. But he found the one way to do it which is what all players find Chuck is if you get hurt. You're not going to accomplish what you have to accomplish in this game and he's been hurt a lot during his career. Twenty three homers, 72 RBIs on 123 games back in that 2011 season. And he has so many gifts and that's why you keep waiting and waiting to see if he can put some seasons together. Well, these days he's usually usually he's a platoon player. Yes. So that brings up a, a question that someone asked me prior to the ball game, Steve how many at bats when you evaluate players how many at bats can you judge a player. During the course of the guys called up, for example, the White Sox have a lot of young players that have shown a lot of promise. When can you say this guy has arrived as a ball player? How many at bats do you need? Are we looking at 250, 300? No, it's really, it's really hard to evaluate when a guy becomes the player you want him to be or think he can be. And mostly, you'd like to see him play a full season. Like for Avisel Garcia, this is his first full season in the major leagues. A lot of people would like him to be better than he is at this point, but what he's saying is he's still learning because this is his first full season. A roller, Abreu steps on the bag, and the runners advance. I would like to thank Lenny Ellis, who tweeted me, very kind of her. He said it sounds weird but peppermint's going to help your voice. Just make sure it's real peppermint. Well thank you. I just don't have any. So hopefully nature will bring my voice back tomorrow. Or tonight. Think positive. Or later on. That's right. But that's very nice and we'd just like all of you to know that I do read all of the tweets. Yes. Try to respond to a few when I can. And we love your tweets. And we're going to go to Steve Stone, yours truly, Chuck Swirsky, fill it in for the Hawk in the fourth inning. We have a lot of great response for questions for Steve, and we will certainly take advantage of Steve's wealth of knowledge, who is an outstanding pitcher in the big leagues, as you all know, folks, won the Cy Young with the Baltimore Orioles. That Super was great back, at the plate. That, that was back, back so far. Who can remember that far back? <laughs> We have two outs here for the Mariners. Sucre, this has been an interesting storyline for the Mariners as well, dealing with the catching situation. Well, Sucre can really catch, but he can't hit very well. Former number one, Mike Zanino, was just sent down to the minor leagues, and he was a guy that they thought could get it done for them. It hasn't worked out for him. But when you're a high number one and you're a catcher, you're going to get every opportunity. and. Lloyd McClendon just realized that Zanino at this point was a bit overmatched. They're hoping that when he comes back, and it's not going to be all that long till he gets back, that mm -hmm. he works something out. Well, I mean, he was really struggling talking about Zanino, and, and Lloyd McClendon was discussing the fact that not only from an offensive standpoint, Steve, as you mentioned, his batting average under mm -hmm. 200, but also defensively, and it's tough. It is such a difficult position to master. It's also very difficult for a young catcher to not take his bat behind the plate with him. Going the opposite field, 
And Garcia with running catch in right field. Gorgeous play by Avi Garcia. So the Mariners strand a couple. We go to the bottom of the second here in Chicago with the White Sox and M's. First class, Aaron Toppin. He was a lifelong Sox fan. In June of 2014, Aaron was killed serving his country in Afghanistan. He is the only soldier from Illinois to die in combat duty since that day. The presentation on the field. So our thoughts to the Toppin family and to all the men and women serving our country throughout the world, protecting our freedom. Toppin family receiving a standing ovation here at U.S. Cellular Field. Chuck Swirsky along with Steve Stone, bottom of the second here. Game two of a four-game series. Samarja goes tomorrow against the Mariners. Taiwan Walker delivers to LaRoche. LaRoche, 12 homers, 42 RBIs, batting 213. The season he'd like to forget. You have them sometimes, but you yep. don't like to have them the first year you come to a new organization. Nope. Trying to turn the corner, however, in the final 36 games of the season. 318 over the last six games, a couple of homers and five RBIs. Walker thought of very highly by Seattle. They drafted him in the supplemental first round. 43rd pick overall in 2010. He's a big, strong young man. Mm -hmm. His nickname is Skywalker, as we talked about his love and passion for the game of basketball. And all you have to do is go on YouTube and you'll see some of his action at Ukaipa High School in California. He's a routine play there, retiring Adam LaRoche. <laughs> And the White Sox are hosting Faith Day on Sunday, August 30th. Chicago's own Vertical Church Band will be playing a pregame acoustic set. Be sure to stick around after the game as Adam LaRoche and other players discuss their faith. And to purchase specially priced tickets, visit whitesox.com slash faith. Alexi Ramirez stepping in against Taiwan Walker. Give me a, a, a capsule summary on the Ramirez season thus far. The highs, the lows. I think it was a real tough beginning for him, especially on the defensive end of it, Chuck. But lately he's playing pretty good defense. I think he would be disappointed in the batting average. 
He's the only White Sox shortstop ever that's received the Silver Slugger Award. He got that twice, 2010 and last year. So you would have to say that the ability is there. Beginning of the year, however, he just didn't start off well, didn't start off well defensively. Right about the time that Sanchez came to play second base, he started really tuning up defensively. And together, they make a very good double play combination. Good point you just brought up because Robin Ventura addressed that very subject prior to the ball game, Steve, and he talked about how the defense, the infield defense, has done a fabulous job of late. Well, that coincides with Tyler Saladino coming up also, Chuck, and that's really made a huge difference. There's a routine fly ball. Right center field, Austin Jackson camps under it and makes the catch. And, and Steve, when, when you talk about the infield defense, speaking to Saladino prior to the ball game, you know, he was a shortstop, as we know, at AAA because Davidson was playing third. But Saladino certainly has done his job defensively. I think he's made the conversion exceptionally well. It's not an easy conversion from shortstop to third base. Because where you have to have range and be quick at shortstop, you just have to have first step quickness at third, and you have to have terrifically quick hands. Because the ball is coming down to you much more quickly than it is at shortstop where you've got time to adjust. Soto batting 255. And you talk about this. Last night, Seattle started Brad Miller at third. That was his first career big league start at third. And he has floated in the infield and the outfield. He's not in the starting lineup tonight with Seeger at third. That was his fifth ball game, talking about Brad Miller. And you talk about the difficulty of going position to position. That was his fifth game last night at five different positions in as many games. And just like that, Soto is retired, and so the White Sox. So we go to the third here in Chicago. Mariners, White Sox, scoreless. visit the Sox welcome 16 teenage oncology patients to batting practice and they enjoyed tonight's game or enjoying it in a suite we're now joined by Dr. James LaBelle and Isabel Lopez and Isabel let's go with you first because you were down by batting practice what did you have a chance to do uh, we had a chance to meet some of the players and get a ball signed by them and we were able to see inside the pit as well that's kind of nice. And, and doctor, your pediatric oncology as well as stem cell research, that's something I think that a lot of people are really interested in. How far along are we and when can we hope to get some cures for these terrible diseases? You know, luckily we've made a lot of progress in pediatric cancer uh, and treating it over the years. And, um, you know, we still have a lot of way, long way to go, but we're, we're making progress every, every year, uh, substantial progress. 
and the White Sox and you are joining hands to fight uh -huh. cancer and I know that uh, Jerry Reinsdorf the owner of our ball club is very philanthropic and has the organization with Christine O'Reilly and everybody involved with community outreach uh, just doing a great job raising money for various wonderful things. It's an unbelievable partnership that White Sox have with uh, Comer Children's Hospital and the University of Chicago. It is really a treat to have all these, you know, kids like Isabel come with us without without their parents, uh, only with other kids who are undergoing the same problems, uh, same treatments, uh, and just to be together and uh, and watch baseball at the same time. So the White Sox have been fantastic. It's been unbelievable. Isabel, this ballpark is known for having wonderful treats, some great candy, some wonderful things that you can have and they bring a cart by so make sure that the doctor or whoever your friends are with <laughs> allows you to get some of that okay okay definitely it's great to see you here thank you very much for coming and doctor thank you very much for your research all you're putting into it and hopefully before long we will find a cure to many of the things that are still plaguing us thank you Steve. it's been great thank you, thank you. Thank you, and I'll tell you what, on behalf of the White Sox, but also the Bulls, I want the two of you to be my guest at a Bulls game this year. Wow. I happen to be filling in for the Hawk tonight. I do the radio play-by-play -play wow. with my man Bill Wennington on the radio side. But, Steve, if we could arrange that, and Bob Grimm, I'd love to wow. see you at a Bulls game. Be fantastic. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're in the uh, top of the third here after uh, Marte struck out on a cold strike. He's going to bring on Seeger. Got a base hit in the first inning of play. The Mariners have stranded three runners here early in this ball game, and they're 0 for 5 with runners in scoring position. Nicely done, Stephen. Thank you. Johnny Danks on the mound. It's certainly very difficult for those children. Yes. And for the people like. Dr. LaBelle that work with them on a daily basis and try to do whatever they can to make sure that they can halt the progress of these diseases uh, just gives you an idea about um, how dedicated these people are to their craft. Easy fly ball for Melky Cabrera. Nelson Cruz. Step it in. Cruz had a sensational season a year ago for the Baltimore Orioles. In fact, he did some big time damage, then left as a free agent, signed with the Seattle Ball Club in the offseason, four years, 57 million. You know, Steve, he played. You know, people think that this guy has, you know, had season after season. Let me tell you what, Steve, he was a late bloomer. You look at his career. He bounced around different organizations, a lot of minor league ball. And a lot of strikeouts. Yes. And in fact, he played for the nearby King County Cougars 12 years ago. At that time, that was in the Oakland system. But he's been with the A's, he's been with the Brewers, he's been with the Mets. But he really arrived, certainly with uh, Texas and with Baltimore. That's going to hold up for Garcia. Makes the catch. Easy inning for John Danks. Good job there by the veteran lefty. We go to the bottom of the third at a moment right here on Comcast Sportsnet.
Chuck Swirsky filling in for the Hawk, who's under the weather. He'll be back tomorrow joining Steve Stone. Always a pleasure talking White Sox baseball with the Sox and the Mariners. Sanchez really has come to life as well with the bat. The second half of the season has some great mitts, as we know, defensively. He's got those soft hands, Steve. And he can certainly has demonstrated his athletic ability that he's a fixture at second base, at least in my opinion. You do see him day after day. I think he's got a chance to be something special at second base. We know he can do it defensively. We know he can do it left-handed. He's hitting 259. What he's got to do is start to pick it up when he gets a chance to hit right-handed. But he's still very young. And coming up through the White Sox system, he was the youngest player at every level that he played in. So it wasn't easy for him when he got there. But he got his opportunity, and he's made the most of it. Every organization would love to have a lot of switch hitters, so to speak, if they're that capable of doing so, Steve. But it takes a special breed of a player to be able to master that. Especially if you can come close to being the same kind of hitter from both sides of the plate. That's not easy to do. Sanchez goes the other way, but a belt high catch in left field by Gutierrez. So, Steve, if we could stay on that for a moment as far as. So when does a player realize, you know what, maybe switch hitting isn't my thing? I mean, is it does. Well, we've seen we've seen a lot of guys doing that lately. Shane Victorino from Boston decided that left handed. He just couldn't get it done. So he decided to just hit from the right side. We've seen it just the opposite way with Pablo Sandoval. He decided not to hit from the right side. He's going to hit entirely left handed. Just depends on the success you have. But I think young guys like Sanchez, they want to figure out how it's going to play out before they go back to just one way. Because when you're a switch hitter, you always see a curveball or slider coming into you. Mm -hmm. When you're one way, you see a lot of breaking balls away from you. That's ripped to left field. A couple of steps back once again by Gutierrez. But Tyler hit the daylights out of that ball and unfortunately didn't have a chance to get up high enough. So two down now. The White Sox with only one hit in the ball game. Seattle with three. Adam Eaton at the plate. And last night, what I like to see Adam do, he tried to do it two times, only to get knocked down by hanging curveballs. And then the fourth at bat, he laid down a perfect butt. Just knowing that he's going to do that makes Seeger come in on the grass at third. There's a couple of veteran Elvis fans. Yeah. At the track, and the center fielder Austin Jackson runs it down. So three up, three down for the White Sox in a fast-moving ball game. We go to the fourth at a moment right here in Chicago.
And it came on a 3 6 3 double play off the bat of Robinson Cano. Now he doesn't run down the line. It looks to be that he's hurt. You see him here. He kind of comes out gingerly. He's not running. And after an error and a base hit, Mariners come up empty in that first inning. Mm -hmm. Cano certainly a seasoned ball player. Was in the World Series in 2009 against Philadelphia. And maybe that $240 million deal, a little bit too pricey for the Yankees. And Seattle opened up the wallets. Already paid Felix Hernandez, the King Felix, big money at 175. Cano got 240. Nelson Cruz close to 60 million. It down. Does he have a play at first? Did he get him? Got him. Yeah, Cano is not entirely healthy because usually sniffing a base hit, he'd have been able to beat that play. That was a one hop rocket to Tyler. He was able to knock it down and stay with it. That was sharply hit. Saladino, so impressive defensively. This gets Cano by a half step. Kept his concentration and Robinson is just not running as fast as he can, even though he's sniffing a base hit. So he's a little tender. Just to bring on the left fielder, Franklin Gutierrez. Gutierrez single to right center in the second. The Seattle Ball Club that unless they have a miracle run, and I'm talking a miracle run. They're about to go to 14 straight years without postseason baseball. Toronto has had 21 years, but again, unless they fall off the map, and I doubt that's going to happen with that lineup of theirs, Blue Jays have gone 21 seasons without postseason since 93 when they won the World Series beating Philadelphia. And Steve, they had to go and talk about the Mariners in the 90s. Mariners at one point were a very strong organization only to see it slip away as it will happen so often. He set up the middle for Gutierrez. And if you're looking for a private and exclusive Chicago cruise on the lakefront or Chicago River, contact Anita D, the Yacht Charters. Anita D Yacht Charters specializes in fully customizable corporate outings, social events, and weddings aboard their two private and exclusive luxury lot venues. Book today at AnitaD.com. Say what the weather here in Chicago this summer has been spectacular. Most unusual this particular homestand as far as temperatures are concerned for August. But I'm sure the pitchers really enjoy it. Maybe the hitters would like it a little bit warmer. I would think so. Austin Jackson stepping in. Steve, how would you rank as far as just a hitter's ballpark in the American League U.S. Cellular? This is a pretty good hitter's park. The ball jumps, especially when it's warm, it jumps to every part of the ballpark. Center field is not overwhelmingly deep. It's 400 feet. I would think if you talk to hitters around the league, they will tell you that this is a really good place to hit. And for Austin Jackson against Johnny Danks, anywhere you face him yeah. is a good place to hit. I have him watched him in Detroit. This guy's just a really good player, period. I remember watching him in the Arizona Fall League when he came up at the Yankees organization, and he was known at that point as an untouchable. 
everybody went to the Yankees and they talked trade. They talked Austin Austin Jackson. Well, he was in the David Price deal. That's going to be a wild pitch. Yes, it is. He was, but the thing that got him out of New York and convinced the Yankees that they could make the trade was Curtis Granderson, a dead pull hitter with a very short porch in right field and right center in Yankee Stadium. And the thing that convinced Detroit, Curtis Granderson wasn't exactly a burner in center field. And because of the 420 in center, they had to have somebody who could really go get him. And Austin Jackson was that guy, so it fit perfectly for both teams. Big whip by Jackson. On the pitch tracks, this is a straight change down and out of the zone. And Johnny keeps it down. Enough deception, certainly, where a hitter can't adjust. When it gets up anywhere from thigh to belt, a hitter can still be fooled and get a good swing at it. We have two outs here for the Mariners. We're in the fourth inning here in Chicago. You know, Steve, as, as a viewer, and I watch you and Hawk all the time, and I love pitch tracks. As a viewer, it's it's terrific, and I love it. And all the technology and all the graphics, and Jimmy and Mike do such a great job, our entire crew, with the White Sox. But as a viewer, I can't get enough of it. And all the analytics with all the stats now for baseball. If there's one sport that really brings out the best as far as stats, it's baseball. It's going to be that way for a lot, and especially it's it's coming on big time in the NBA. I know that with the Bulls coverage. Well, they certainly have a way to quantify most everything these days, Chuck, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. Nope. Trumbo just sticks his bat out. Short right field Sanchez covering a lot of ground and makes the catch. And we go to the bottom of the fourth at a moment right here in Chicago scoreless on Elvis night. And Jose Abreu stepping up next along with Melky Cabrera with the White Sox and the Mariners. Don't forget about Avi. Is St. Patrick's Day presented by Miller Lite. The first 20,000 fans ages 21 and over will receive a White Sox Irish flat cap. Be sure to stay after the ball game for fireworks. Miller Lite, the original light pilsner and official beer of your Chicago White Sox. Chuck Swirsky along with Stephen O'Stone. Those are handsome caps. I love those Irish flat caps. Deep fly ball, left field, and it's tracked down on the warning track. Abreu flies out to left. Gutierrez has had a very busy evening. And the Sox have gone up there against Walker attacking the first pitch. Now, is that something you would find in a scouting report, Steve? 
This is a guy who throws a lot of strikes. So I would think yes. If you get a first ball fastball to your liking, you might as well jump on it because it might be the best pitch you'll get in the sequence. And although his curveball is good, it's not great, but the straight change is very good. And you're not going to get as good a look at it because it's 88, 89 miles an hour for a straight change. That's awfully hard. So Melky Cabrera doubled in the first. Loops a fly ball and it's going to be called once again by Gutierrez. So see when when you and you've been doing this for a long long time as a broadcaster but as a pitcher at what point in a game do you say you know what I don't have it tonight I don't have my curveball I don't have my slider I don't I, when do you realize in a ball game that it's just not going to happen well first of all the, the hitters tell you if you have it or you don't because you're not getting them out and second of all you're going to have to make an adjustment the older pitcher you are the more of a veteran you are the quicker the adjustment is going to be. So before you give up the four runs, you realize that the curveball is hanging, and then you go and look for something else. Go to your slider, go to your cutter. And a lot of times, if you're a young pitcher and you have a veteran catcher, and that's why they like to put veteran catchers with young pitchers, they'll go out there and tell them, look, Let's stay away from this. They won't they won't phrase it like we can't use this tonight. Mm -hmm. Let's stay away from this for a while. We'll go to this and then when it comes to you we'll use that a little bit more because you want to phrase everything in a positive nature. The ball hit down the right field line out of play. So is that is that a, a conversation that a pitcher and catcher would have in the dugout. At, at times, uh, or it, it depends on when it pops up. I mean, sometimes you, as you, if you're a catcher, especially a veteran catcher, you don't want the game to get away from your pitcher, so you'll go out there in the middle of an inning. Sometimes, if he gets out of the inning, but maybe he's given up a couple of really hard hit balls, then you're going to go talk to him on the bench and say, "Look, it's rolling. Your curveball's rolling tonight, or the slider's just not biting. So let's try something else." Garcia strikes out here to uh, end the fourth inning of play. We'll return in a moment here from Chicago. Mariners and White Sox are scoreless. Ken Harrelson alongside Steve Stone. We're scoreless here. Mariners with four hits. The White Sox with a hit. You've been a very good defensive broadcaster. 
Now work on your offense. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> not not this half inning, but the next half inning. Well, got goose eggs on the scoreboard. Johnny Danks, who saw the Seattle Ball Club a week ago in the Pacific Northwest. Much better outing here tonight than it was the last time he looked at him. Logan Morrison steps in to lead off the top of the fifth, batting 220. Hooks it foul. There's an example of looking for a pitch, getting it, and hooking it way foul. Fortunately, John threw that fastball right in on his hands. And looking for it all the way, he fouled it over the Seattle dugout into the upper deck, which is a good trick. If you just joined us, the uh, Mariners made some news today. Jack Sorensic, the general manager of the ball club, was relieved of his duties. And so, Steve, you have been through as a player in big leagues where a manager is replaced in season. I don't know if you were you know, privy to a situation where a GM was replaced in season, but does it have a, a ripple effect in the locker room when a GM is replaced? Are they not at the time? In other words, it's not going to affect the guys in the locker room this year. Depending on what happens with the whole coaching staff, and we don't know that Lloyd McClendon's in the last year of his contract. So we don't really know how that's going to play out. The players as a group don't really feel the effect of a general manager change. Again, until they get his replacement, they see what happens, see who they keep, who they decide to move along. The first check, what has to happen is they've got to get as an organization a plan. Mm -hmm. Try to figure out just exactly where they want to go. They've tried to do it with offense. Obviously, you spend a great deal of money on Cano. You spend a great deal of money on Cruz. That hasn't worked because the bullpen disintegrated. They've had some very good starting pitching, but they probably need some more of that. 3-2 pitch. Well, Steve, they've had five losing seasons in the last seven years. And if you're Seattle, you know a couple of different things. Number one, you probably didn't think Houston would come on as quickly as they have, and they're in your division. They're going to be good for a long time yep. because they've got some very good young players in a very deep system. Texas, they got Cole Hamels. He's going to be around for a while, and Texas usually makes their presence felt in the division. The Angels, well, they're usually pretty good. So you've got a division where at the time, at this time, Oakland is down. You've got to find a way to deal with those top three teams in your division and find some way to become competitive with them. Now this year, for whatever reason, this Seattle team against the West is 26 and 25. They've played them head up. So that part of it's good. There's a ball hitting the gap, but Melky Cabrera can't come up with a play. Simply missed it. And that's going to be, I would imagine, a double for Logan Morrison. Morrison had some very good swings at Johnny Danks before he hit this ball, and he took it the opposite way. This is a fastball. It's low on the outside corner, and Melky doesn't make the play. Nope. Let's see how Bob Rosenberg rules this one here. It's a double. Yep. That's the first Seattle extra base hit. Sox have just one hit. And that was a double in the first inning by Melky. Sucre now who flied around in the second step of it against Danks. Here's an example, Chuck, of he's not a particularly good hitter. But what he's got to do is find some way to get the ball to the right side. Mm -hmm. what, what amazes me, Steve, after watching baseball 24 7, 
and I am a huge fan, and I love, you know, the pass, Major League Baseball pass with all the games. The lack of fundamental bunting in this sport. It's atrocious, Steve. Yeah, you don't see a whole lot of it. Sucre, however, is one of the guys that can bunt. Here's Soto to get him at second. Got him! What a peg by Giovanni Soto! <laughs> he doesn't have to worry, Sucre, have to worry nope. about Buddy. Morrison can't get back in time. A pinpoint throw. And Morrison just tags himself. Fly ball to Adam Eaton. Just like that. Two down. White Sox fans use the force to make the jump to light speed and head out to the ballpark for Star Wars Day on Sunday, September the 13th, presented by Coles. Come dressed in your best Star Wars attire and march at a pregame parade around the field. You're probably going to see Steve Stone. First 1,200 fans to purchase will receive an Adam what a Kenobi bobblehead. No, I'm um, Obi-Wan Stoney. Yes. <laughs> No, on that play with uh, Logan Morrison, what happened there, Steve? It's the toughest play for a base runner because he's anticipating contact. When a guy bunts through the ball, you're trying to get a good jump to third base. It's especially important if you don't have great speed, and Morrison doesn't. So he's thinking about getting a good jump. In the meantime, Sucre bunts through the ball. Good, solid throw by Gio. And they cut him down. That could turn out to be one of the biggest plays in the game. So to tell Marte who reached on a Ramirez error in the first struck out in the third. And they're giving him a good look here. This second half of the season. This is a routine ground ball easy for Sanchez over to Abreu. And we go to the bottom of the fifth here scoreless for the White Sox it ends. Ball. LaRouche attempts a bunt, and that's going to be an easy play for Zucre. Mm. Good thought. Bad execution. And now it's time for you to tweet your strongest fan photo. Use hashtag Chicago Data Strong Fan. You just might see yourself in an upcoming broadcast brought to you by T Mobile.
I certainly applaud the thought process of Adam LaRoche as they were giving him the entire left side, but not used to bunting, he popped it up. So Ramirez rips a base hit to left field. So for the White Sox, only their second hit on the night. The other hit belonging to Melky Cabrera is 29 double of the season. He gets a first ball fastball and it's right down the middle. Takes it into left field and normally you would think about perhaps stealing a base here with one of the Sox best base stealers. But you got a man behind the plate in Asus Sucre who can really throw the baseball. Ramirez 15 for 20 in stolen bases. So let's see what uh, Soto can do here. He struck out in his only appearance against Taiwan Walker. Now Steve, um, you, you've seen Walker over the past couple of years. What type of pickoff move does he have at first? I think it's okay. I don't think it's great. It's rare for a real big guy to have a very quick move. The exception, James Shields, who was in our league for quite some time before making his way to San Diego. That was a good healthy cut by Gio as he got a fastball to his liking and fouled it straight back. So here you have an idea of how intricate the stats get. Okay. Chuck. Yep. Taiwan Walker has allowed only two bases in 33 at bats on high fastballs in the past month. That's second. Out of 35 qualified starting pitchers. Slugging percentage of 0 0.61, the league average 432. Mm. So it shows you there's some life on that high fastball. So let's go through this process, Steve. Who breaks this down as far as when, when you watch a game? They've got people that are watching a game and say, that's a high fastball. We're going to enter this into yes. a computer, and that's how it happens. Now, is it usually someone at the ballpark, or do they have... There's different groups that do it. Every team uses different different people. This happens to be a group called Inside Edge. They do a very good job. Some of the stats, and I was just reading that as an example, but some of the stats you kind of discount. Some of them, however, are, are pretty relevant. Mm -hmm. But we are... Finding the ability to quantify just about everything. There are still some things, however, that they're not ever going to be able to quantify. Such as? Trying to figure out a guy who's never been in a pennant race if he's going to shrivel up in a pennant race. If he's never been there, you really don't know. So when you acquire a guy that might have pretty decent numbers... You can look at his past. He might have the misfortune of playing with teams that aren't particularly good. So you're going to try to figure out what he's going to do if your team is good enough to be a contender for postseason play. But it's tough to do that. So September baseball, mathematically, both teams are still in it. But realistically, Seattle probably not so much. White Sox... Still in the hunt for the um, wild card. There are five out behind New York and Texas. What do you learn about players, Steve, in September baseball if you're on the, on the fence, so to speak, or if you're out of it? I'll wait for this pitch, and then I'll tell you. Soto goes down for the uh, second time tonight. All you can ask of a player, Chuck, is... To continue to give you everything he's got on a daily basis, regardless of where the team is. And it comes down to personal pride. Every team would like to be in the playoffs. Every pitcher would like to win 20 games if they're a starter. Every hitter would like to hit 300. The fact is that most pitchers aren't going to win 20. Most hitters aren't going to hit 300. So if you're going to hit 240, you have to be the best 240 hitter you can for your team. Meaning run the bases well, field well. Hustle all the time. And other than that, 
if you don't do that, you're not only cheating your teammates, but you're cheating the fans who are coming out here on a daily basis and paying to see you play. And that's a situation you never want to get in. Yeah, you don't play to the scoreboard. You don't play for the standings. But do you learn about a player, Steve, in a pennant race more so than you would if you're 10 games out, 13 under 500, whatever? Sure, if you're lucky enough to be in there. But there's some guys, you know, there's some great players, Chuck, that never made the postseason their entire careers. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, they didn't have the second wild card. They didn't have a wild card when you play. But, Steve, I, I'll tell you what, I love it. I think it, it's created so much excitement for a lot of cities. September baseball is relevant in a number of markets. As do I. And it's nice to see great players have an opportunity to get in the postseason. For instance, we just have to look to the other side of town. Ernie Banks, great player, never, never made the made postseason. Mm. Rod Carew made the postseason, never made a World Series. There's a lot of great players that never got a chance to show what they could do on the big stage. Easy play for the shortstop, Marte, and that's going to end the inning in a fast-moving ball game here in Chicago. We go to the sixth, scoreless with the Mariners and White Sox on Comcast Sportsnet. And you can receive a scratch, a win ticket for your chance to win a trip to New York to see the White Sox battle the Yankees. Throw out a first pitch in a White Sox game. Great offers from Famous Daves and discount White Sox tickets. Head to your local Famous Daves today for your chance to be a winner. Heart of the order due up for Seattle. This the third time through, so this should be a difficult inning for Johnny to get through, and hopefully he can put him down without a great deal of trouble. And you're seeing this because the batters have seen Danks now a couple of times. Third time through, and you've got Seager, Cruz, and Cano. If anybody gets on Gutierrez, it's four guys who swing the bat pretty well. Seager is one for two, batting 255 at a healthy swing out of this. And by the way, we are going to go to Twitter. We started this, folks, on Twitter, and thankfully that Hawk and yourself are back on Twitter and on Twitter, period. But we started this, folks, during the road trip in late May, early June when I was filling in for Hawk, and it was really welcomed by our viewers on Comcast Sportsnet and White Sox TV, and we appreciate that because, you know, here I am sitting next to a Cy Young Award winner, which doesn't happen every day of the week, folks. So you can uh, tweet us at Steve Stone or at Swirsk, my nickname, S-W-I-R-S-K-054. So we will go to your tweets, and we love your tweets, 
Anytime we can interact with the fans is always good. And we appreciate you uh, offering some comments, questions about White Sox baseball. And there's a deep drive right field. Garcia, look it up. And that ball is gone. Just like you said, third time the charm, unfortunately, for the White Sox and Danks. But Seeger with a solo blast for the first run of the ball game. What happened there, Mr. Stone? That fastball that Johnny intended to get inside didn't get inside enough, and that's a 19th of the year. Ford home run replay. And Kyle Seeger with his second hit of the night. This one a no doubter. And that breaks breaks the scoreless tie. So Nelson Cruz, who's 0 for 2, he flied out to uh, first in the first, flied out to right in the third. He leads the American League not only in homers but hits. He has a one hit lead over Kinsler of Detroit. Altuve right there, knock it on the door. A Houston ball club is. A pleasure to watch, Steve. I'll tell you what, I've seen a lot of Astro games the last, you know, a couple of months since the White Sox played them. We had the pleasure of doing some games at Minute Maid Park. That is a young, upcoming team, and they've arrived. I don't, this is not a fluke. They're not going away. No, they've got some very good pitching to go with all that young talent. Carlos Correa looks like he's going to be a superstar. Does he remind you of A-Rod? Yes, a as, a, as a young A-Rod, certainly. But that Houston team is five games in first place over Texas. They've won two in a row at home. They've just dominated 45 and 21. Mm. That's a good ball club. Dallas Keuchel's having a year where he's going to contend for the Cy Young Award. Saladino scoops it up. Tyler's had a good night defensively, and that ball was hit awfully hard by Cruz. Stays down with it, knows he's got some time, and pours it across to get him. Well, we have a lot of baseball remaining, and it's going to be very interesting to see if the Astros here as we approach the month of September, feeling the uh, pressure if those young players can handle it. But I think they can, Steve. I really do. I think they're well managed. I was going to say they've shown every indication at this point that they can get the job done. And A.J. Hinch, this is his second go-round. I talked to him about it, and he said completely different than the first time around. He said the first time around I was a very young guy going down in the dugout. There were guys older than me I was managing. He said I don't think I was quite as prepared as I thought I was at that time. He said looking back I realized what I didn't know which is difficult to do when you're in the middle of it. Well they put it all together. With their management. A.J. Hinch, as you mentioned, Steve, the young players have certainly matured overnight. I mean, I thought they were going to be much improved. I didn't expect this. They're first in the league in pitching. 3.30 ERA. As Cano goes down. And, and here, when we talk about Houston, all we do is talk about their amount of strikeouts, their amount of home runs, but we fail to mention the fact about their pitching, I'm glad you just did. It's by a wide margin over Kansas City, and Kansas City's pretty good there at 356. But Houston, 330. Houston second in the league in defense. They've only made 63 errors. Baltimore leading the league. They've only made 53. They're leading it by a wide margin. We have two outs here. Solo blast by Seeger giving the Mariners a one nothing lead. If the season ended today, Steve, is the team to beat still Kansas City or do you like Toronto? Or maybe Houston? Team to beat is the champion, the American League champion, until somebody beats them. And as good as Kansas City is, and I believe they're really good, they don't have overwhelming starting pitching. They got a great bullpen. But the starting pitching has been problematic for them. 
All right, so I'm going to put you in the chair as a general manager, Steve. If you build a ball club, do you build first with your position players or do you build a bullpen first or a starting pitcher? I know it depends on what you have, but, I mean, in a make-believe world, what would the first priority be if you were to build a ball club? Carlos Correa, shortstop. <laughs> True. No, I mean, you want to have – you want to have – you'd like it to be your best player and hopefully your smartest player playing a position where he's involved in everything and the shortstop is. And I, and I I really like you know what Conger and Castro can do beyond the plate for the Strohs. Yeah. But yeah, the basic fundamentals up the middle. You got El Tuve, who's been there a long time and has done a terrific job. Now you have Correa. That Keystone combination looks like they're going to be there for a while. A long time. And I mean, Houston is a major market ball club. I mean, they've got what uh, probably outside of New York, L.A., Chicago, they're the fourth largest market in the country. And they're starting to recapture the fandom. Yes. From the time when they were pretty good not too long ago. Gutierrez is two for two tonight. And he rips one to left field this out of here. To a couple of homers given up by Danks here, and Danks disgusted with himself. And as Steve Stone wisely mentioned, even prior to Seeger and prior to Gutierrez, is that Danks facing these Seattle Mariners the third time around. It was going to be a little tougher this inning than it was previous to that. And Johnny now has given up 20 home runs for the year. That's second on the ball club behind Jeff Samarja. Our fourth home run replay. This one is up in the zone and gone. Three for three for Gutierrez. Mm. That's his 10th. He's now driven in 28. With two outs for Austin Jackson, one for two, singled in the second, struck out in the fourth. Well, they always say, Steve, it's a game within the game. So what adjustments when you face a batter the third time around Take us through the mindset of a pitcher as far as what he has to do. And in the case of Danks, give it up a couple of homers here. It depends on how analytical you want to get, but you pay attention to where the guy hit the bat the first couple times up. If he hit it on a sweet spot, even if he made two outs, he's beaten you. You're going to have a tough third time around with him. If he's hit it off the end of the bat or just above his hands, then you've beaten him, even if he got a base hit or two. So observant pitchers figuring out where a hitter has hit the ball on the bat. You know you're going to have to adjust one way or the other. And the bullpen up and going. It's Matt Albers throwing for the Sox. We're going to go to your uh, Twitter questions. And they're starting to line up for Steve. And we appreciate it. At Steve Stone. At Swirsk. S-W-I-R-S-K-054. We'll go to those in the uh, bottom of the sixth. Austin Jackson strikes out not before however John Danks gives up a couple of homers to Seeger and Gutierrez respectively 2 nothing Seattle here in Chicago.
It's uh, the day after the White Sox score five or more. You get 50% off your entire online order at PapaJohns.com with the promo code SOX-5 at participating Papa John's locations. Just rolls off your tongue. Papa John's. Hopefully, All you need is a few more runs here. Yeah. And it's pizza for you, Chuck. Pizza for me. So we're going to go to tweets. Swirsko 54 swirsk 54 Steve Stone, at Steve Stone. Much simpler than Swirsko 54 I'll say that. <laughs> Two-nothing Mariners here in the bottom of the sixth. Lacey fly ball short right. It's going to be snagged by Cruz. So, Steve, here's a, uh, a tweet from Bobby Resigliano. It says, uh, Steve, what was your routine on pitching days during your Cy Young season? I mean, you won, what, 25 games that year? Yeah, but who's counting? <laughs> pitching routine was the same at home because you could control that on the road a little bit different. But I always went to the same restaurant every morning. You went to the same, same restaurant? Morning. Yeah, got the same thing. On the day of the game. On the day of the game. Now, what what was the what was the meal? I mean, you said you ordered the same thing. Yes. What was it? It was a breakfast of champions, hot turkey sandwich with hash browns. A couple of quick outs here. So, a, a turkey sandwich. Hot turkey. Hot turkey. With gravy, and then I went to a bookstore, looked around, got something. If something caught my eye. Then I took a walk. Then I went home and did all of the things that I had to do to prepare for the game. I went through the lineup in my own mind mentally all three times, 27 outs. Everybody up, everybody down. So every pitch I was going to throw to every hitter on a given night. Abreu with two outs here in the bottom of the six. So mentally during the the morning early afternoon you knew for example let's say you were playing you know let, let's just toss a team out there i knew the lineup i mean let's you say i playing milwaukee so i had paul molitor robin yount cecil cooper ben ogilvy gorman thomas uh, uh ted simmons jimmy gantner well simmons wasn't there yet at that point and so i would go over each and every one of the hitters and so when i faced them that night i had already seen them in my mind's eye. Seemed to work out pretty well. Yeah, it did. So you had an idea then, Steve, at like 10 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, this is my approach to Molitor. I'm going to throw in. Wow, that was a quick inning. we got to pick some more tweets up real quickly. <laughs> We're not going to have much time. <laughs> well, it's 2 nothing Mariners here. We go the seventh at a moment on Comcast Sportsnet.
using MLB.com ballpark to unlock offers and rewards. The official U.S. Cellular Field ballpark app for your iPhone and Android smartphone perfectly complements and personalizes your trip with ballpark maps, mobile check-in, seat upgrades, and more. Download MLB.com ballpark today or visit WhiteSox.com slash ballpark app to learn more. And we've got Matt Albers coming in the game on for the 18th time. He's 2-0, ERA 188. Johnny Danks went six, gave up a couple of runs on seven hits. Didn't walk anybody, fan five. Those young fans realize there's still nine outs to go. Yes. They're not giving up yet. So give me an idea what you saw at a Danks tonight and your thoughts on Albers. I thought Johnny threw the ball pretty well. Made a couple of mistakes. But other than that, you know, he only gave up two and six. Quite obviously, Walker's thrown a little bit better, but I thought I thought John threw the ball well. Matt Albers has been throwing it pretty well all year long. As he gets a lot of movement. He's got a good sinker. Throws a lot of ground balls. Well, again, a couple of solo shots in the sixth inning for Seattle. Mariners 10 games under 500 and they're trailing Houston by 12 in the West. They're going to get a long look when the roster expands September the 1st at some of the young talent. Little chopper. Saladino makes it look so easy and granted that was a routine play but he has quick feet. He anticipates well. He's got a chance to be a pretty good player. I do believe that eventually he is ticketed for shortstop. Yes. But I think wherever you play him, he's going to be very good at it. He's got a good sense of the game. And you can't teach good hands. You either have them or you don't. He's got very good hands. Logan Morrison slices one right up the middle for a base hit. White Sox with only two hits in the ball game. That was Seattle's eighth. The last time our ball club saw Walker. He went five and two thirds, gave up five runs on seven hits. Another uh, Twitter question Swerce go 5 4 at Steve Stone. They want to know, Steve, a couple of uh, tweets regarding the American League Central, not only today, but as we look down the road for 2016, 2017. A lot of things can happen, certainly with farm systems, with trades, with free agency. What do you make of this division? Kansas City is going to be around as a strong team for a while. Minnesota brought up one of their young players, Miguel Sano, and he's hitting everything in sight. We're going to see him when we go to Minnesota on this next road trip. This guy is close to the size of a moose. And he can hit him eight miles. So he's been pretty impressive. They can ever get Byron Buxton healthy enough to play. They're going to have some really good young players. Dozier has been very good for them. They've gotten surprising pitching. Cleveland's pitching is pretty good. They're going to have to do something with their offense. As far as Detroit is concerned. They're going to have a new leader. But they also have to revamp their farm system. And there you look at the division with our Sox and the Indians, identical records. The Tigers 
right behind at 18 back and Kansas City making a shambles of the race. I think it's going to be very interesting, Steve, to see the direction the Tigers go. Dombrowski is now with the Red Sox, as we know, and it's going to be, I think, interesting to see if Brad Ausmus hangs in. I think he's a pretty good man, he, but that bullpen has really, really labored yeah. over the last couple of years, really. That's been the big problem. So Detroit has had a big advantage over the last few years. Their owner, Mike Illich, has spent a great deal of money on that team, and he would like to see one world championship in the not too distant future, but a lot of people feel the same way. Tigers have just spent more money chasing it than most. Yes. Just missed. Two and two the count with an out here in the top of the seventh. Mariners with a two nothing lead. Nice backhanded by Saladino. One and then wide of the bag, but they did get a fielder's choice. Now he was called out. Could very well be that they're taking another look at it from the dugout to see if they want to appeal this play. And that's exactly what's going on. That's Trent Jewett who was on the phone. This is a terrific play by Saladino. Throw is in the dirt. And I don't think they're going to appeal that at the end of the day, but Lloyd, I guess, feels there's nothing to lose. From that angle, it looked like he had it in the glove. That's because he did have it in the glove. Yes, he did. Terrific play by Sanchez on the low throw. Especially knowing that Morrison was bearing down on him. Take one more look at it. Good pick. Watch it in the glove. Right there in the glove before the foot's on the bag. This should be a relative no brainer in New York. Most of the White Sox right now looking at the scoreboard with the replay. As the umpires with the headsets on, find folks in New York. You've got every player now looking at that replay with that center field camera from behind. And they're just hanging out. They're waiting like all of us are. I like what Matt Albers is doing because he's not standing on the mound, yep. just being an observer. He's making sure he's loose. Because regardless of the resolution of this play, He's still going to deal with the top of the order. Well, Steve, this gives us uh, another opportunity as the umpires, maybe they're receiving the information now from the headquarters to see what's going on. A lot of White Sox fans on Twitter want to know about your optimism for 2016. Where does it stand? A lot of baseball to be, you know, decided in the rooms, of course, in the conference rooms in the offseason about the direction of the ball club. But what are your thoughts about 2016 that you can you know, build on as far as based on what you've seen the second half of the season? Well, the young players are guaranteed to get older. And that's good. And hopefully they will get better. I'm always optimistic going into the next year. Oh, and he's been ruled safe. He's been ruled safe, and I can't understand that, but it looked to be a very easy play to make, and Robin is now coming out. He wants to talk with Mike Everett. He saw the same angle we saw, and it looked clearly like he was out at second base. Mm -hmm. Now was was the foot on the bag. 
there's what it was. The foot does come off the bag. The ball beat him. But as he was raising his foot off the bag, thinking about making a throw to first base, that's probably the key. The ball did beat him, but his foot was off the bag uh, when the ball went to the glove. Excellent camera angle. All the men and women in the White Sox production area. Thank you very much. That was a, that was a great angle on yep. that one. I think they got it right. They did get it right. From that angle, yes. Yes. So, Robin Ventura has a few words and ready to get this game as Coop pays so a visit. As Robin goes back to the dugout, Don Cooper comes out from the dugout. Well, this is all happening now with one out and the Mariners with runners at first and second. And a 2 nothing Seattle lead on a couple of solo home runs by Seeger and Gutierrez. Those coming in the sixth. The White Sox with only two hits in the ball game. Because nobody's up in the bullpen. It's going to be Matt Albers against the top part of their order. Could tell Marte is 0 for 3. He's the leadoff hitter for the Mariners in the ball game tonight. He's playing Triple A ball to start the year in Tacoma, about uh, 30 to 45 minute ride to Safeco. You know, having grown up in Seattle, Steve, I was around when they had a Triple A ball club, the affiliate first with the Red Sox, then with the Angels, and then the Seattle Pilots came to town. A short-lived Seattle yes. Pilot ball club. An expansion team in 69. Again, that was the season in 69. They had three other expansion clubs joining Seattle. They had Kansas City. They had Montreal and San Diego. And then the Pilots just had so many financial situation with Six Stadium and whatnot. And Bud Selig bought the ball club and moved it to Milwaukee for the 1970 season just weeks before the uh, start of the regular season. Is running grab by Milky. And then the Mariners came to existence in 1977 with Toronto. That was in the old kingdom. Yes. Now Steve, were you with the White Sox when they played Toronto in the first game? Ever? Yes. I was indeed. First game was snowed out. It was snowed out. Yes. At the old exhibition park. Yes. Two out, two on for Seattle with Seeger, who's had a very productive night, two for three, including a solo home run. Steve just ran down his thoughts about the 2016 campaign with some of the teams. In the American League Central, the Indians won their third in a row tonight, beating the Angels three to one behind Trevor Bauer. And Trevor Bauer wasn't supposed to start that game, but they had some problems, moved him up a day, and it didn't seem to hurt him any. Bauer now ten and ten. We also talked about the abilities of the Houston Astros in that tough American League West, Texas. Up 3-1 tonight. Hamels with 10 strikeouts. He's retired the last 13 he has faced in that ball game. 3-0 count coming up to Seeger with runners at first and second for the Mariners. Texas is playing Baltimore. Baltimore with just two hits through seven. Yep. And right now the Mariners with the bases loaded here. In the seventh inning to play with two out. Time now for our AT&T Universe Multiview. Not the best speed on the base bats, but a pretty good hitter up. In Nelson Cruz, speaking of Baltimore, he had a 
tremendous season a year ago for the Orioles where he banged out 40 and drove in 108. But he left the Orioles for Seattle signing a four year deal. He's in the first year with the Mariners. It's a cold strike. If you're going to try to prove yourself by taking a one year contract as a free agent. It's good to hit 40 home runs. And you get to make a great deal of money with the next club you go to close to 60 million. But he has produced. One one count. Well, the Orioles right now on the outside look at it and still knock it on the door for a wild card spot. But you lose guys like Cruz and Miller, the reliever to New York. It's tough. Cruz with a slugging percentage of 845. And this is by far the biggest out of the ball game. Big strikeout, and that ends the frame. Cruz goes down. We go to the bottom of the seventh. White Sox with some work to do. They've been limited to two hits, and they trail 2-0. A strong fan photo of the game. Tweet your strongest fan photo to hashtag Chicago Data Strong Fan. You just might see yourself in an upcoming broadcast brought to you by T Mobile. Here we are, the bottom of the seventh here in Chicago. Taiwan Walker is just mowing them down, folks. Melky Cabrera at the plate. Cabrera with one of the two White Sox hits, his 29th double of the season. It's pretty amazing when you look at the pitches. He's at 69 pitches. We're in the bottom of the seventh inning. Well, this is what Lloyd McClendon was talking about prior to the ball game when I asked him his assessment of Taiwan Walker. He likes the way now he's being able to change speeds. The fact that he's allowing the game to come to him. Not rushing things, not trying to get too ahead of himself. And again, he just turned 23, Steve. No, he's got a chance to be a real good one and averaging right around eight and a half innings, eight and a half strikeouts per nine innings. He has a tendency to run up his pitch count, but not tonight, as our Sox have been swinging at a lot of pitches the first or second pitch of the at bat. 
going the opposite way. Cabrera with the second hit of the ball game. Talking with Rick Riz, the outstanding voice of the Seattle Mariners, about Taiwan Walker. He said, if you watch his delivery, and Steve, certainly you're an expert on this, he says he steps into his delivery. It's almost like a stretch, a, a mini stretch. And he said he's a big man at 6'4", and he thinks that has helped him a great deal. Well, the first guy we saw doing that was David Price, where you limit the amount of moving parts in your delivery so you can get back to repeat your motion. That's the key of pitching, repeating your motion over and over again. And that's what you're looking for in a pitcher as far as just the consistency yeah. of... Now, the one thing with Walker is he has given up 22 home runs this year. That leads the ball club by a wide margin and gives you a little hope. With Garcia at the plate, who's 0 for 2. White Sox with a leadoff man on with Cabrera. LaRoche in the on deck circle. White Sox trailing 2 0 here in game two of a four game series. The margin goes tomorrow night. Carson Smith loosening in the pen. We've seen him used all over the back end of that bullpen, including as a closer. Now we're going to have a meeting on the mound here. Steve, what do you think this is about? Well, I think where they're trying to get him out is a high fastball. Last time he missed with it. Sometimes what a catcher will do, especially a guy who's very good at blocking pitches in the dirt. He'll tell the pitcher, okay, if I call a slider or in his case a curveball, bury it in the dirt, I'll block it. He went back to the high heat, and that was out of the zone. Just foul down the left field line. Zach Duke loosening in the pen. We saw him last night. He pitched an inning, got out of a second and third, nobody out jam. Garcia goes down swinging. If you've ever dreamed of being a major league ball player, this is your chance. Dodgers, White Sox, fantasy baseball camp taking place January the 18th through the 24th, 2016 at Camelback Ranch, Glendale, Arizona. And to reserve your roster spot, email fantasycamp at camelback-ranchbaseball.com or call 623-302-5078. So LaRoche, who's 0 for 2, grounded out to first in the second. And then squared around a bunt and popped out to Sucre in the fifth. So Cabrera, at first, he has two of the three hits. For the White Sox, man on deck, Lexi Ramirez with the other base hit. Check swing safe. Now well, the appeal to Chris Siegel, and yeah. he says, Nope. Nope. LaRoche once again facing that shift. Three and one.
It looked Boy, like he might have hurt his I, hip. I think you're right. On the last pitch before he threw that one. And he is, it appears that again, I'm not a doctor, but he certainly looks like maybe that hip area, upper thigh. That's what it looked right to leg. me like on the last pitch when he threw that fastball to run the count to three and one. It looked to me like he felt a little gimpy at that point. So watch this. Now, right there. To me, right there, it looks to me like he's trying to stretch out that hip. Yeah, he flinched a bit, did he not? And that one, he just goes down. Yep. So that's going to be it for Walker. Yeah, he's walking gingerly off the field. So as he goes out, Carson Smith is going to come in. He'll have as long as he wants to warm up. We'll step out and be back after these messages. Join our own Chicago, Chuck Garfine, Belton Bill Moulton for a recap of the action, plus game highlights, clubhouse reaction, and a look ahead on Super White Sox post game live on CSN Chicago. And the Frog X Parachute team, I, am, I, I, I can't do that. I, I, I don't know why not. I hope, number one, you'll never get me jumping out of an airplane. No, I can understand that. Our Honda call to the pad. And there's look at Carson Smith on for the 57th time. He's one and five. Fine ERA, however, of three point. And this is a guy that took over as the closer. He's got 13 saves. They just designated Fernando Rodney for assignment. The Cubs were the team that picked him up. Yep. And apparently. Smith is not going to close these days. Well meantime it's three balls and two strikes. We have one out here in the bottom of the seventh and a two nothing Mariner lead. Cabrera remains anchored at first. And they've got a shift on, although everybody is on the infield dirt. First and second. One out. That's going to bring on Alexi. That's the first walk of the ball game for the Mariners. That one is going to be charged to Taiwan Walker.
So Lexi, one for two. He flied to center in the second and singled in the fifth. 2 8 no for the Mariners. No runs, three hits, and an error for the White Sox. The error committed by Ramirez. Little opportunity for the Mariner right-hander to get into a rhythm with Walker coming out because of injury. And a ball and two strikes. Garrison Smith attended Texas State University. Also going there, the Diamondbacks first baseman, the very talented Paul Goldschmidt. Mm. Boy, he's a good one. Yeah, he's a franchise player. That's an understatement. He's having another monster year. That fastball by Carson Smith to Alexi Ramirez registered at 95. On the fast pitch gun brought to you by Xfinity, the fastest Wi Fi at home or on the go. So Lexi batting 237. Trying to bring home at least one run here in the bottom of the seventh. He fights it off, and the count remains one and two. Off the pitcher Smith, deflected and then kept in the infield by Marte. That was a rocket. I don't think that hit his mid. I think that hit his body. Yep, it did. And they're going to go check on Smith. This most likely saves a run as it hit him in the hip. That's going to load him up. Says he's okay. Probably they're going to let him take a couple of pitches. I would think so, yes. Vidal Nuno loosening up. We saw him in a starting role in Seattle. Sox here make things very interesting with one out and the base is loaded. So Smith says he's okay and I think he's going to face JB Shuck as Soto was called back. We well, got Cabrera on at third. They got LaRoche at second and Ramirez at first. All this happening with one out. Chuck Homerless has driven in 11 this season, batting 280.
Back to Seager. He goes to the plate for one. Over to first, and that is a double play. My goodness. So just like that, the White Sox come up empty after loading the bags with one out here in the bottom of the seventh. Two-nothing Seattle. We go to the eighth at the moment on Comcast Sportsnet. It was the ultimate White Sox raffle, but tomorrow the players' favorite things baskets we're talking about with the wives of the White Sox. Bidding begins at 5 o'clock Central Time, ends at 8 o'clock Central Time. Go to ChicagoWhiteSox.com slash wives or call 312-674-5683. 312-674-5683. And then on Sunday is the ultimate experience broadcast auction which is a lot of fun, I'm sure, with Steve Stone and the Hawk getting involved. We have a new catcher, Tyler Flowers, but meantime, a tough, tough situation with J.B. Shuck grounding in to a 5-2-3 double play. That was a pretty quick one right off the bat. And Sucre made a good, solid throw with a tough angle. We're in the eighth inning now. Cano at 276. That was a good straight change. Mm -hmm. Cano hit into a double play in the first, sharply hit the third for the out in the fourth. In a key situation, Smith induces Shuck to ground into the 5 2 3 double play. Seeger is right there. Makes a good solid throw. And on the back end, they cut down Chuck by a couple of steps. So Cano goes down swinging for the second time of the ball game. Gutierrez had a pretty good night at the office, Steve. I should say so. A couple of singles and solo home run. Providing the second of two Seattle solo homers. We haven't received word yet on uh, Taiwan Walker had to leave the ball game. If we do get some word, we will certainly tell you. Yes. In this day and age with the uh, dish and the satellite feeds, I'm sure friends and family probably watching. Our telecast, if not us, certainly around Seattle, the Seattle feed about 
his situation. So as soon as we get word from the Mariners Media Relations Department, we'll bring it to you. Have you ever injured an IT band? <laughs> I'm no. serious. No, I am not. That could very possibly be what it is. I'm not that athletic. I'll tell you what. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes. But that was painful. And you know what, Steve, to your credit, and you've been on the mound, certainly, and you know what a pitcher goes through. You called that. You knew the pitch before he went down. What happened? Well, it looked to me like he was trying to somehow he might have thought he had a cramp. And he was trying to find some way to loosen it up. And on the next pitch, he just crumbled. Well, Lloyd McClendon has to be proud of the job that uh, Walker turned into. Oh, he was he was absolutely terrific. He winds up going six and a third. Giving up just. The three hits. One walk, six strikeouts, and no runs. Sometimes you have to draw in the side. Yeah. Somehow we need to probably fix that. Get her a real. Some Long real set. burns? Yeah, with some real burns. We have one out here in the eighth. Did that hit him? Yes, it did. Certainly looked like it did. Trying to sink that Ooh. one inside. Looks like it hit him right off the knee. Yeah, the left kneecap. Or the right rather I'm sorry looking at it on the replay and he's taking a slow walk to first base so now the Mariners with a runner on with one out is going to bring on Austin Jackson who's one for three got a base hit in the second Been a frustrating night for the White Sox. That double play ball. Hit to either side of Seeger. Maybe you've got a chance. You at least certainly get one. But right at him. Right at him with the Seeger playing in. Yeah. He also made the wise choice. Much more difficult play if you try to go second to first. Especially with the way Shuck runs. Dan Jennings loosening in the pen. So Seattle with two solo homers in the sixth inning of play. Seeger, along with Gutierrez, who by the way is on at uh, first base, three for three a night. You got Trumbo in the on deck circle for the Mariners, who have eight base hits in the ball game. It wasn't long ago where Gutierrez. Was a speed burner. Swiped 25 bases in 2010 with Seattle, was only thrown out three times. But those days have gone by the boards with a lot of injuries. Going the opposite field, and that's going to be a base hit to right field. So now, first and second with one out. Nice piece of hitting by Jackson. And here comes Don Cooper. Looked like a change. It was right around thigh high and taken into right field.
And we're going to have a pinch runner at second. Gutierrez is leaving the ball game. That's Seth Smith, who will also come in, play left field. Yeah, journeyman ball player, spent some time with Colorado and Oakland and San Diego, had that good fortune of being on that run by the Rockies in 2007 when they went to the World Series, losing to Boston. Pretty good switch hitter, or not a switch hitter, pretty good left hand hitter. In fact, we saw him last night. And he came on with a base hit. Actually, he doubled and put runners at second and third in the seventh inning. Zach Duke got out of it. There was nobody out at the time. Smith at second. Jackson at first for Mark Trumbo. Trumbo is 0 for 3. Two and zero, mm. a right hip flexor cramp took Walker out of the game. Infield fly rule, and we have two outs. And here comes Robin. With so Morrison do up. So as Jennings comes into this, we'll step out. Be back after these messages. On your smartphone or tablet, stay connected to the White Sox all season wherever you are. MLB.tv game of the day, in game highlights, live look ins, replays, reviews, radio broadcasts, and more. You can browse the app's new features, including StatCast tracking videos and bilingual access for Spanish speaking fans. Download MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball. And I love that app. It is great. It is fantastic. We got a Honda call to the pen, and it is Dan Jennings who inherits a couple of Mariners on first and second. On for the 36th time, he's one and three ERA, just below five. And he's looking in at Logan Morrison. Who's two for three, by the way, he has two of the nine hits for Seattle. We have two outs here. And the M's with runners at first and second. Give me an idea what you've seen out of Jennings. I know he's been banged up this year and been on the DL, but overall the volume of work. When he has been healthy, his stuff is good enough. 
The only problem is like so many young left hand pitchers getting the ball over the plate when he does he's pretty good. Because of his arm angle, which is not low three quarters, left handers get a better look at him than they do against some of the other situational left handers around. But he's got good enough stuff to make up for that. A couple of bouncers. And running to the bag is Abreu. And that'll do it. Nice job by Jennings. We go to the bottom of the eighth. White Sox trailing 2 0 here on Comcast Sportsnet. Ball game. You realize the Mariners are 0 for 11 with runners in scoring position. Dan Jennings got the job done retiring Logan Morrison. Well, unfortunately, the two solo home runs in the sixth inning have told the tale. So Seth Smith, who came on to pinch run, stays in the game in left field. Yeah, Taiwan Walker was brilliant before leaving with what did you say, a hip flexor cramp? Cramp, yeah. I mean, that's probably the best news could probably come out of that as far as. Seattle is concerned the fact that it's just a cramp. Well, gave up only three hits, six Ks, did his job. Let's see what Sanchez can do now here in the bottom of the eighth with the White Sox, limited to four hits. That's it, two by Cabrera. Seattle bullpen up and going once again. Chuck Swirsky, Steve Stone here. Hawk will be back tomorrow under the weather tonight. Now, know you're watching Hawk, and everyone missed you at the ballpark, and that's a cold strike. And Steve, you mentioned the radical change from one year to the next with the bullpen with Seattle. And you want to get into the Seattle bullpen. Now you do. Last year. We kept raving about how great Kansas City's bullpen was, and it certainly was, except Seattle's was better. They were the number one bullpen in the major leagues. One hopper and a flip covering the bag. And a quick out here. 
High school football is back tonight at 11. Tune in to CSN for the season premiere of High School Lights, the best prep football recap show in Chicago, hosted by Kelly Cruel. It's an exciting, informative half hour of scores, highlights, interviews, fan reaction, and more. Watch High School Lights premiering tonight at 11 on Comcast Sportsnet. You know, I, I, I know the fine folks at Comcast are, you know, Chuck's getting ready with Bill on the postgame show, and Kelly's putting all the scores together of the, you know, Chicagoland football. i got to find out who won the Wheaton North, Wheaton South football game. That's a huge game in Page County. I love high school football. I love football, period. But, you know, this is the first big week for high school football in our area. You excited about that one? Yeah, I am. I, I, I think it's great. The atmosphere of high school football on a Friday night, terrific. And hopefully the atmosphere here, Steve, the White Sox will get some hits. We need some. Well, you can throw out the standings when those two teams go head to head. I love that clue. You're talking about Wheaton North and Wheaton South. <laughs> uh, maybe the Tigers of Wheaton South will prevail. But both are going to be very good this year. Logan Morrison runs in a few steps, makes the catch. There's a look at Tom Wilhelmson, king size right hander. A couple of years ago, he was the closer for this team, and he was a good one. Nicknamed the bartender. The bartender. He took four years off, interrupted his professional career to be a bartender. Really? Yeah, then realized he could probably make more out of the bullpen than he could tending bar. You know, those tips may not equal the major not league quite salary. As, no, not quite as much. The bartender. Yep. Hmm. He took four years, not a year. But four. four years off. Another infield play, another unassisted for Logan Morrison. That'll do it. That was a very quick one, two, three. We go the night, two nothing, Seattle. It is 2-0 Seattle. As the Mariners have handcuffed the White Sox, holding the Sox only four hits. Dan Jennings remains on the mound for the White Sox. Seattle 2-9-0. Jesus Sucre, the catcher, is 0 for 3.
broken bat, ground ball. Easy 4 3. Game three of this four game series. Tomorrow night, join us for game three as the Shark takes the hill for the Sox against the Mariners. Coverage begins at 5 30. White Sox pregame live presented by Orland Park Toyota on Comcast Sportsnet. Alongside Steve Stone, this is Chuck Swirsky. Thanks so much for having the dial set to Comcast Sportsnet tonight. For the White Sox and Mariners, Ken Harrelson will return tomorrow. Marte is 0 for 4. It was also just a very big announcement in baseball. I know you'll be very happy with it as I am. Vin Scully has said that he will be back for at least one more year. Which is always great news. He usually makes that announcement around this time of year. Might be the greatest of all time. Yes. I personally believe he is the greatest of all time. Well, you you know, Steve, help me out here. Was that 67 years now? This is, it will be his 67th year. And we've got to we've got to have the fine folks at CSM. Maybe Chuck Garfine can check on this. And uh, let's see what happens here with Jennings. But I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chuck, but I believe that Ben Scully actually replaced Ernie Harwell as voice of the Brooklyn Dodgers. I think Ernie left, and that's when Vin Scully came in. So we'll check on that. Because Ernie did the Brooklyn Dodgers. He did the New York Giants. He did the uh, Baltimore Orioles uh, before going to Detroit in the 60s and, of course, was a legendary Tiger announcer and an icon. But we'll check on that. I, I think Vin actually replaced Ernie. But we'll check on that. Either way, you're right. I mean, Vin Scully is an institution. I mean, wow. And he, and he do, goes solo, does he not? Yes, he does. Flowers pounces on it. So Kyle Seeger who has a solo homer, one of the two Mariner runs, coming off the solo home run bat, Seeger and Gutierrez. Dan Jennings has been very effective coming out of the pen tonight for Robert Ventura's ball club. The pitching has been very good. Johnny Danks went six. Gave up the two solo home runs on seven hits. Didn't walk anybody. Fan five. Albers came on, threw the ball very well, and Jennings has come on and thrown it well. That wild card situation Texas right now if the season ended tonight Rangers would be in and Hamels acquired by Texas from Philadelphia several weeks ago struck out 10 as the Rangers cruise past Baltimore. Orioles just running out of steam. Running on steam and also playing in a very tough division. Mm -hmm. Toronto, New York, and Tampa Bay. Although Tampa Bay isn't the toughest team around, there's still a challenge, especially in their home ballpark. There's a base hit up the middle. So Seeker's third hit on the night. That's going to bring on Nelson Cruz. Cruz is 0 for 4. He has reached base safely in a career high 37 consecutive games. So that's in jeopardy. That's the active on base streak is the longest in the American League this season. Third longest in the majors behind Holiday and Tulowitzki. 
We have two outs here in the ninth. Cruz leading the American League in homers with 39, leading the American League in slugging percentage at 612, first in OPS at 1,000, first in hits with 155. Time for second in average at 320. Other than that, Steve, not much Other of a year. That hasn't been a real good year for him. 2 0 count. That one shaves off the inside corner. The wave going around the ballpark on Elvis Knight. He had throwback yesterday with those Southside Hitman uniforms. That was fun. Yeah, it was. So the wave. And, and ironically, the wave was started by a Seattleite, Rob Weller, who was a Yale King for the University of Washington. And that's when it began. So the Mariners, Seattle, University of Washington. See, the dots connect, Steve. It's unbelievable. Yes, it is. Cruz wasn't particularly happy with that. No, call. he wasn't. And Mike Everett explains to him that he thought it was good enough. You see where the five appears? Nelson thought he'd get on base again. Cruz remains alive. Ten hits for the Mariners. Scored both runs, solo homers in the sixth off tanks. We have two outs here in the ninth and a 3 2 pitch coming up. And too much time taken, so looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth, it'll be Abreu, Cabrera, and Garcia. The heart of the order due up. Yeah, Breo's 0 for 3, a couple of strikeouts. Cabrera's 2 for 3, however, raising his average to 275, and Garcia's 0 for 3. First things first. Right back to Jennings. Beautiful play. Nice fielding work by Dan Jennings. And we go to the ninth. White Sox hoping to tie it up here or even win it with a walk off. 2 0 Seattle.
We'll start with a couple of home runs. Solo shot by Seeger that coming leading off the sixth inning. Then Gutierrez. It's his perfect night intact, but his tenth home run. And then a 5 2 3 double play with the bases loaded. And the Sox come up empty. And those are our Miller moments as Tom Will Helmsen comes in the ball game. One and two ERA 386. Four for four and save opportunities. Yeah, give me a book on him. Give me a book on him as far as. Got a good overhand curveball. Used to throw a lot harder, but he throws still pretty hard. Last time we saw him, got it up there 95 96. And he's now started to take over the closer role, which he had lost for a couple of years. Fernando Rodney, who they designated for assignment, had 48 saves last year. And Rodney has resurfaced with the Cubs. We are not even Joe men. Two were together in Tampa. But Jose Abreu now 0 for 3, struck out in the first and sixth, flat out to left in the fourth. Routine pop up. The play made by Marte. The wind drifted that one yes, around a did. bit, but he was able to stay under it and make the play. He's going to bring on Cabrera now with one out. The bottom of the nine, Cabrera two for three, doubled in the first. Fly to left in the fourth, singled in the seventh. Only four hits tonight for the White Sox. Give credit to Seattle. They have shut the door. That double play ball off the bat of Shuck hurt the White Sox. But you got to give a lot of credit to Taiwan Walker. He was in command. I thought he had a very, very good night. So, Marja going for the White Sox tomorrow. Hope you can join us right here on Comcast Sportsnet as the Hawk returns to the booth with my main man, Steve Stone. You know what, Steve? I'm, I'm going to say this, and I know at the end of every broadcast we have player of the game. I'm going to give you the player of the game because you have battled through that raspy, sore voice. I'll tell you what, you've done a great job. You're a gamer, man. I'll tell you, it's no fun. This is our livelihood. This is our vocation. Covering the bag. And that goes 3-1. Well, so we're thank down you, to Chuck. The final out. You did a terrific job tonight. It's not an easy thing stepping into a situation after you have been gone for some time from it. Well, it, it's always tough when you fill in for a guy like Hawk, who obviously is an icon, and one day will be in the Baseball Hall of Fame, certainly. But you know what, Steve? I, I appreciate I learned so much working next to you and listening to you. But what I'd like to see you do is work on your offense. So far, you haven't been able to push any across. You know what? I was hoping I was six and six in yeah. late May, well, early June. You never know. Yeah. It's a strange game. You never game. know. It is a strange game. And that's going to bring on Garcia with two outs here in the ninth. Avi is 0 for 3. And it was that one inning, Steve, and you called it. And for those of you who just joined us on White Sox baseball, scoreless ball game, we go to the sixth, and Steve Stone says, you know what, Chuck? This is the third time around for John Dengs. And Seeger Gutierrez went yard. Off-speed pitch. Well, unfortunately, John didn't make too many mistakes tonight. He actually threw the ball very well. Yes. Gave up a couple of solo home runs, but nobody's been able to figure out a way to win with no runs. There's a fly ball to left. This should end it. And it does. So this ball game is over as the Mariners prevail 2 nothing here against the White Sox. I thought Johnny Danks did a pretty good job. Unfortunately, the offense could not get it done against Walker in their pen. 
And the series now, Chuck, is tied at 1-1. Thank you very much for sitting in for Hawk, and we will see you down the road. My pleasure. Thank you. Our player of the game, Franklin Gutierrez. But I'm giving it to Steve Stone. With all due respect to the left fielder of the Seattle Ball Club. All right, so for my partner, former Cy Young Award winner, I never get tired of saying that, Steve Stone. Our director, Jim Angie, our producer, Mike Leary. Guys in the truck have been outstanding. Our associate producer, Jeff Sermon. Our tech manager, Mark Harper. And for the executive producer, Jim Cordo Jr., this is Chuck Sworsky saying so long, everyone. You've been watching Chicago White Sox baseball on Comcast Sportsnet.